Well, here we are. Here we are. Uh, welcome to Off the Cuff. I'm Phil Kakachi, uh, one of the co-artistic directors of Berkshire Playwrights Lab in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. My colleagues are going to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Felicia, and I'm so happy to be here. I'm James Anthony Tyler, and I'm also happy to be here. <laughs> Uh, Richard Dresser, and uh, I became director at a very meaningful ceremony when Joe Kakachi called me a drink. That's not something that happens very often, but it was enough. Uh, I just want to say I am uh, I'm really happy to be there, <clears throat> like be here, like James and Felicia. Um, like James, I've really benefited as a playwright from what BPL has done, and uh, not a lot of organizations do this. And uh, it's really important to us that we make it through these perilous days and we're there and uh, making an impact on the other side, whatever it is. So uh, it's great to be here. You know what? Um, okay, I'm kind of feeling some type of way because Joe didn't buy me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> me either. He didn't buy me one either. So uh, what's up with that? No. You guys told me you didn't drink. Oh, no, oh, you yeah. know I didn't tell you that. Exactly. We were well, <laughs> well over 18. Uh, right. All right, that's nice to know. Tonight right. I will take you all to dinner, even though we're in different cities. There it Postmates. is. Postmates. Um, so, yeah, so here we are. So we were thinking, uh, we all got together uh, in March and decided that maybe we should think of something other than doing play readings online, because we couldn't do our normal season this summer. Um, and we came up with the idea that we would have a sort of freewheeling conversation with some of our friends, writers, actors, directors, producers, and talk about how we in the theater are facing and will continue to face um, these various challenges. Uh, and so that's the premise of the show. And tonight we've got five people we, we really love. And uh, so I guess we'll start by introducing them, uh, although I know so we drew we drew straws and uh, Felicia and I lost. So we're hosting, and uh, Rick and James are going to go quote backstage and uncork the Woodford Reserve. <laughs> um, anyway, see you later, guys. You going to throw in some questions later? Oh, there they go. Uh, you want to start us off? Oh, you're muted, Felicia. You're muted. You know what? Uh, no, I can't go first because I didn't. I didn't memorize the oh, okay. alphabetical order. Okay. Yeah, the alphabetical order. Huh? Yes. Okay. You know what? I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just thinking. I was like, we don't know the alphabetical order of our guests. That's not a good look. I think, um, I think Jamil is first. Jamil Jew. Jamil Jew okay. is the artistic director of uh, True Colors Theater down in Atlanta and a, a brilliant playwright and director as well. And we worked with James Anthony Tyler a lot. And hopefully we're gonna all be working together, uh, James and Jamil and Wendell and me on James's play uh, when we all open again and can do plays. So Jamil, come on, and there you are. Thank you for coming. Hey, what's up, everybody? Man, it's a, I'm happy that, you know, as a J, I get to go first. This <laughs> almost never happens, so. <laughs> wow. Well, I feel you. Yes, I'm right after. I'm not right before you. <laughs> oh, nice! I'm so happy that you came. That you came through. That's what's up. Yeah, no, no doubt. James calls. I always answer. So. Oh wow, that's nice. <laughs> that's. Uh, so I would think Marcia would be next. All right. You want to do it? <laughs> you you know, want to about Marcia. I don't even know Marsha. I know James Tyler, and I know that James Tyler was at Juilliard with Marsha. 
And the only way that I, I even know about Marsha is because he talked about Marsha all the time. And so without further ado, here's Marsha. Thank you, thank you. I love James, I love Juilliard, although I have retired. I don't know if James knows this, but I, I, I taught my last class on Zoom sometime in uh, May and I'm like free human now. I mean, I'm still, I'm still teaching at Yale um, in, this, in the springtime, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm having that adjustment of life, you know, where it's like you don't have work to go to unless you, unless you sit down and, and dream it up. So I'm really happy not to have to make that weekly trek into the city. Yeah. I love the Berkshires. I love, um, I love being at this part of my life where I, where I'm thinking about like, what is it? Okay. What do I do now? I mean, I've done, I did all that like barnstorming early. I like broke down the doors and made it, you know, I made it possible for women from the South to write plays. And it, you know, I did all of that and that was all good. And then I did, a, you know, I did, I got my prizes and I had my fun and I, and I did my teaching and now I'm going like, hmm. And now I'm looking out the window watching the ducks. <laughs> and, I'm, and I, and it's a, it's a little bit puzzling to be a retired writer because I think we all, um, I didn't retire from writing, um, but yeah. I wonder what I'm supposed to write now. And I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I have ideas, but I think that it's, it's not a different question than I ever asked before. It's just a different time. You know, there's, I don't have any, I don't have any excuses now for not writing that play about my mother and her friggin' sister. You know, I don't, but <laughs> that does not mean I'm going to do that, but it just means yeah. I know that's the piece I was supposed to write when I, with my elder rage, whatever that was, <laughs> but I, I don't seem to be doing it. I seem to be doing other things. So, it, you know, it's just, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting moment of what do you do with the, the next ever how many years and you don't know how many, whether it's one or 30. I mean, you don't know. You don't know. Well, when you write that play, Marsh, you got to give it to us so we can yeah. it. Yeah. It, it'll, it's going to be uh, filled with profanity and a lot of anger. Just oh, say that sounds great. To me. That Stick sounds great. To me. One of them, one of them, here, I'll just trust, test the idea on you. One of, one of them, these two sisters. So they were both fierce religious fanatics. One of them was violent. That'd be my mother. And the other one was the most loving, peaceful, generous human that ever lived. And she was a nurse. And she was as wondrous as could be. And then there was my mother, who was a monster. And and I and I think, well, this is one of those religious problems. You know that this is a perfect example of what religion can take people in various directions. And maybe this is something to write about, since I, you know, experienced it. But I don't know. I don't know if anybody cares about religion, but me. I guess, I guess I'll find out. We do. Yes, All right. You do? So next, yeah. Next in the alphabet, and also a Juilliard person, uh, Wendell Pierce, got out of there a long time ago and has pretty much done everything an actor could want to do. And then he bought a radio station. He was Wendell Pierce, come on. Hello, everyone. Hi, Welcome. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, I, I do care about religion, uh, Masha, and uh, I know those violent people in religion, too. So I'm looking forward yeah. to that play. And... Um, Yes, uh, I am uh, here back in New Orleans after a year uh, abroad doing uh, Death of a Salesman in London and, uh, and returned to the United States to a pandemic. Um, and so it's been interesting times and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, how people are dealing with that and also uh, with the future of our business, uh, uh, not only our business, but our art um, yeah. is. So I uh, look forward to this conversation off the cuff. Thank you for having me. Wendell, thanks. Um, That's a beautiful commercial, Wendell. Thank you. <laughs> we should. I have to take a little recording this. That was sound by, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. So, yes, record it. Okay. Uh, so, Floaty Suarez is a, a TV producer of note, and then he decided he'd make some real money and go into the theater. <laughs> so he produced a Broadway play. How's that working out? Yeah. Yeah. Got nominated for a Tony. Like my wife always says, you make hundreds of dollars in the theater. Floaty, how are you? Hi, I'm happy to be here. 
I'm uh, I'm settling back into New York after a few months uh, down south and uh, trying to figure out what to do with myself. I was supposed to be doing a tour of the Share Show and a Tom Jones musical in London right now, so I'm here. Well, we're glad you are, even though you're not doing what I know you want to be doing. We're all supposed to be in production. Wendell and I are supposed to be in production on James's play downtown New York right now. We'd be in our uh, week of the run, but. That didn't work, did it? <laughs> uh, Everything's on hold. So, Tracy, Tracy, Scott Wilson, playwright, three times at the Public Theater, uh, four seasons, five seasons on The Americans. I think she won an Emmy in the middle of all that, and uh, just wrote the Aretha Franklin biopic, Respect. So, she's uh, someone we're really glad to have here. Tracy, come on. Hi. Hey. Uh, everybody, uh, because I can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, this uh, te technological problem will get fixed. Uh, not a problem when you have live theater, but obviously that's not happening. So I'm just going to try to fix this, and hopefully I'll join the conversation soon. Okay. Maybe you know what. Uh, Katie, our producer, says if you maybe drop out and drop yes. back in, it might do it. So we'll find out. This is like the 50s with live television, Playhouse 90, where like you're shooting a scene live and there's no seven second delay. And suddenly there's a stagehand goes by on the wing of a plane behind Martin Sheen. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. Anyway, all right. Felicia, would you like to start us off with a question? Yeah. So. And, you know, and just to let everybody know, and just to say it again, we're all talking to each other, okay? Yeah. Joe, Joe and I are just merely just facilitators of you guys talking, okay? Um, but we'll kind of start it off. And feel free, you guys can ask questions as well, um, you know, probing questions. So given um, its far-reaching effects on every facet of our lives, how will COVID-19 impact the theater world? You want to go first? Start with the, uh, the softball, right? <laughs> We're just going to throw it out there. Yeah, um, you know, I'll, if no one else is talking. Um, you know, I, I think what's what we love about it is that communal space. And I think what's, uh, as a producer, I miss being able to shake people's hands and welcome them to the theater. And I think that's the thing that I'm... Or is that um, just me? frustrated, disappointed, saddened, um, that I, I'm not gonna be able to have that relationship with the audience member, that when we welcome them into our house, that it's gonna be you know, through a mask, uh, maybe through uh, latex gloves. Uh, so I'm really sad about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I think all of us are missing. Uh, just the sense uh, of being, uh, walking into a place and communally sitting down and watching something that we collectively uh, can have a reaction to. I mean, that's the role of art, really. I mean, what thoughts are to the individual while we toss and turn in bed at night and reflect on who we are, it's really in our space where we collectively come together and reflect on who we are, You know, decide what our values are and hopefully act on them. Uh, that's my mantra all the time. And I think that what has been clear in this pandemic that I've seemed to observe, uh, have observed was those who were prepared to transition virtually uh, uh, have, have done better than those who weren't. Uh, uh, I, I, I haven't seen any of the Zoom plays or the readings or whatever. I, I just didn't want, I actually just didn't want to hear, you know, this, uh, I didn't want to see a play or hear a play that way. Uh, I would much rather everyone sitting in a room and put the camera on that and reading the play. Um, but, you know, I've enjoyed all of those theaters who before six months ago had set up uh, uh, filming a play to stream it uh, live or to record it and then show it later. It reminded me of the afternoons that I spend at the Lincoln Center Performing Arts mm -hmm. Library watching even those productions that I missed because I was out of town or whatever, but they archived them and I went back to be able to see a play or go back 
and, and watch a play I saw 30 years ago. Uh, last time I was in New York, I watched Fences, the original Fences with James Earl Jones. And I, and I remember what that experience was like for me. I think this will change us. Uh, and though I, I think every theater and every producer uh, should think about that element. I think it should change our protocol. I think we're going to come to a place where we're going to have tech rehearsal. And one element of tech rehearsal will be a camera blocking for the live stream cameras and set that up for when we stream it. And we have to look at our theaters as not being that, uh, you know, that uh, 500 seat theater, but now we have a unlimited uh, audience that we can go to. And we are now going to become, we were always interested, but I look forward to the day that I can open, turn on my computer or uh, open my online on, uh, on the film uh, play anywhere in the world. So um, I hope you guys heard that. I saw that uh, we kind of got stuck there on the internet, but I hope I look forward to the day of opening my computer and watching a play from whatever theater I decide to watch it. And I think we need to look at that as being a part of our future. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, Floaty and Jamil, because Jamil, you're running a nonprofit theater, and Floaty, you're producing commercially with the object of to make as much money as possible. I mean, there's that. Uh, so, how, how do you guys see? I mean, what Wendell just talking about building in that component of recording the thing just from here going forward. Yeah, I, it, it's a great idea, and it and it should be kind of factored in as a revenue stream as well. It, it just you just have to balance whether you're eating up your in-person audience or not. Right. And it's, it's hard enough to, to keep a show up and running. So maybe it's a closing night thing you do, or a, a things where you can bring in a, a chunk of money for the show as well. I know in the middle of the pandemic, a few people are trying to shoot their shows. We'll see how that goes. I know one's negotiating with Netflix and, and we're talking about doing a few other things. So there, there are other, ways to make money, but I think fundamentally, we're gonna to have to look at the economics of, of big musicals, especially, to figure out how to keep everybody safe, how to make audiences comfortable, and how to do it for the right number. And that's gonna take everybody. It's gonna take the unions, it's gonna take the producers, and we're gonna to have to come to some kind of agreement. Uh, you know, I'm doing a show in London, and it's about a fourth the cost, and somebody smarter than me can figure out why, but we have to be able to do these things more economically and we have to look at where those other revenue streams are. And I think Wendell's idea is a great one. I think we're almost there even floaty. Uh, when you think about the, well, London is, it costs less because we have to, there's a, a government and political will to actually pay for uh, and subsidize art because they understand the role of art and its importance. And so it's subsidized where it's the first thing that's, that goes in the United States. But I think that we can look at the National Theater Live, which has been doing those productions for 10 years. As soon as the pandemic shut everything down, that was, our, for me, that was my only theater experience. Yeah. I saw Small Island and I saw, uh, you know, uh, A Streetcar Named Desire and, uh, and, and, and um, Barbershop Chronicles. I'd seen that live and went back to see it on, uh, yeah, I saw the good, I, I've been searching for at one time, the Goodman actually had a production that was on, um, and I was I wasn't able to see it. Um, but I think that that is uh, the thing that happens. I think it should it can be an extension. You know, the show closes, and the night it closes is opening night for it to be streamed. Yeah. And I'm sure that they're going to so you don't cut into that audience that's paying to come and see it live. They're going to be you know um, thousands more who want to see that production who aren't able to come and see it. I've got so many requests for people when we closed uh, Death of a Salesman in London, is there a recording or is there a streaming version that we'll be able to see? And, uh, and then you have some of the artistic choices that people have made that lend itself to the combination of all the technology. When I saw Network in London and when I, when I think of, uh, I didn't get a chance to see it, uh, West Side Story. Uh, the recent West Side Story, 
where you had the combination of uh, live theater and scenes that were shot on camera, uh, backstage in the dressing room, outside of the theater and all around. I, and that lends itself to a combination of the, uh, the mediums, the filming and theater. And I think uh, we can explore that artistically and we definitely need to look at that financially. Yeah, you know, I think the, the days of just showing a lock shot of a stage are kind of over. And now you can do multiple cameras, you can set them up, you can have a handheld, you can do that during one performance, the same way you do an EPK. You can shoot your show in a way that it will edit and you can have a switcher there just doing it for you in a way that gives you something much more entertaining and, and close up than, and real moments for the actors. So, you know, now, you know, it's interesting because you're talking about, you know, the audience partaking in this. And historically, <laughs> the theater. Morris is waving. Oh. She's right. here. She's um, raising her hand. She's respectful. Yeah. Because, <laughs> the, it's, uh, well, here, there's so many problems involved in this, and I know that we all love problems, but the, there are so many problems that have to do with, I mean, what happens to road companies? What happens to high school companies? What happens to, what what happens to your your authorial control over what version of your piece you want out there? We, um, Lucy, my partner in uh, Secret Garden, Lucy did the music for the Secret Garden musical. And so she wrote me, Lucy has a, uh, well, Lucy has a kind of protected view of how things are. And so she wrote me and she said, oh, it's great. This little high school didn't get to do their production because of COVID and they were they rehearsed and everything. And so they're just gonna stream it out live to the world. And I'm going like, God, Lucy, what is the matter with you? You just gave away a world's worth of tickets to our show. That's what you would wanna do. You would wanna just, and so, and then she, this is, I mean, really, the dialogue is like, so then she said back to me, oh, please, Marsha, don't do anything. Don't do anything to hurt their chances. They, they've worked so hard. <laughs> I thought, like, yeah, Lucy, and you and I worked really hard, too, when we were writing this show. So there's a whole new level of contractual arrangements that we have to make to so that we can make sure that it isn't the... It, it, you know, that, that there are certain productions that we are, that are approved by us for streaming worldwide and we get royalties and, the, and those get shared with the actors and that's all good. We can't just let it all go out for free. We, we have to count on our, the Drummond's Guild and the, and, and the, and the actors and SAG and Abbott. I mean, we have to really work on that hard so that the income that we would have had from our road companies and our high school productions and whatever is still going to come to us, even though um, it's going to, it's going to look really different on the, on the balance sheet because it's not going to come from one source. Um, you know, I mean, when you get international royalties, it, I mean, I don't know, it's going to complicate so many things. We just have to be careful to protect our property. We yeah. can't let it go sailing off free into the internet like PDFs did. You know, I mean, I don't know if you, <coughs> There's a terrible problem about people sharing PDFs of plays online yeah. um, saying like, oh, you want to read that play because there's a speech in it. You want to do it your audition tomorrow. I'll just I'll just send you this PDF I have. OK, so that's four dollars of my money that just vanished. And because that theoretically they should have anybody looking for that play of mine because of that monologue they want to do should have had to go to Samuel French and license that, you know, for, yeah. for them. And I, and I, that we are working on that really hard right now. That's being done so that people can find the place. We, the drama skilled can find the place they want and they can license a particular type of, um, of uh, giving, give somebody a particular kind of authority. Like, all right, do you want to do the monologue that's on page 78? Fine. We'll charge you a quarter. You know, but if you want to do a production for your high school, then it's, you know, or your or your college. What we can't do is cause is cause is let our plays become. Um, uh, we can't. We have to keep them as our property, and that's what I, I mean. We have to make money from them so that we can live and write other plays. <clears throat> and you know, the music business faced this. Faced this. They did. I mean, a long time, a long time ago. 
Oh, I'm just hearing that. I guess I better go. Um, but this, we really, we really, we really make sure that people don't use this opportunity to stop going to theater or um, to stop licensing our work. I agree. I think what you're looking at is taking a product and selling it as a separate, as a separate you know, you will right. your royalty, the royalty. Music rights would be taken care of, and everybody would be covered. I think that's the only way. I can't just give it away. And, and even streaming it would have to be some kind of pay per view. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. You know, I think I, I'm. I... Go. Go ahead, Jamil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is just prioritizing the live experience then for our audiences, right? Like um, when we are thinking as producers and as writers and as creatives, right, about how do we get uh, the content out to people. Um, but, you know, uh, Floaty said it earlier, but why would people want to go to the theater? When we talk about the value of that live communal experience, how can we really um, buoy that and make sure that that's the thing, that the play is still the thing, that the live experience is still the thing. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm most nervous about. As a producer of a smaller theater, uh, True Colors is, is not one of your, you know, your large regional theaters. I think we are a major regional theater, um, but we may not be as financed at that same level. Uh, what, what can we do to make sure uh, that people still want to uh, come and enjoy that experience? Because, you know, probably that's where the bulk of our money is going to be made while we understand that there's a lot of money in streaming and things like that. Without a network or a platform, uh, how can True Colors really create enough content uh, so that people will want to buy on a subscriber basis like they do a Hulu or Netflix and things like that? So I'm really interested in, is it going to be up to the smaller theaters or the commercial producers to find ways to prioritize the live experience um, for those audience members or are we all going to kind of get lost in that and the folks who can do the best streaming are the ones who are going to be uh, our leading theater producers? Um, I got kicked out because of the storm here, but um, so forgive me if I'm a, li a little late to the conversation, but uh, Wendell was talking about Lincoln Center Library. Um, I, that's actually how I learned how to write plays. Um, at the time, you know, I, I, I stumbled upon playwriting completely by accident. I thought I was going to be a novelist, but I, I was I had writer's block. I took a playwriting class. I, had, I was living with my mom. I had no money. And somebody told me about this thing called theater on film and tape. And so I would just read a play and then I would go there and, and watch and watch the watch it on tape. And I would go like four or five times a week. Um, and that only actually increased my desire to go to the theater because I, I saw, so seeing the experience, I, and I didn't, you know, I, like I said, I was completely broken. I had very limited experience with the theater when I was a kid. I, I mean, I remember I read probably Streetcar Named Desire and, and maybe Death of a Salesman when I was in high school. But seeing that um, made me actually have thirst more for theater and the, the live theater experience. So then I started to usher on the weekends so I could see the theater for free. So it's like, and, and I, at a certain point, I actually started to bring dates to the Lincoln Center Library to, to see the, to watch the plays with me because I still couldn't afford to go to, to the theater. So I, it, it, it only, I increased it increased the appetite for for live theater, increased it increased my interest in theater, and I just think having letting people have more access to that yeah. is only going to increase your audience. Is only going to is only going to widen your your subscriber base. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, 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 you know, it sparked in me, a, you know, just a lifelong love for theater because I, I, it's just something I just didn't have access to. Yeah. You know, it's um, interesting that you're talking about access, Tracy, because um, one of the things that we know that the audience, um, that the main audience that supports theater is old and, and white. And so are, do you think that they're going to come back to the theater? Like, do you think that that, you know, the, 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 the audience that is marketed to and mm -hmm. the audience that is solicited and the audience that is made uh, where the, the experience is uh, made accessible is old and white. There's an audience out there that hasn't been marketed to. There's an yeah. audience out there that hasn't been approached. There's communities and stories and communities that we have not even delved into and produced 
And we see that continually that uh, we have marginalized huge, huge portions of our population and push them outside of the group that we market to. I always go back to, I remember Cape Man on Broadway, <laughs> right? Cape Man is on Broadway. You have Mark Anthony and Ruben Blades on Broadway. And you're thinking, I just have to fill a thousand seats a night with that, those two in this story, done. Paul Simon wrote it, oh, done. It's gonna be an amalgam of an audience that is going to diversify. And it closed, I hope none of you were involved, I apologize, <laughs> right? It closed while Mark Anthony was selling out Madison Square Garden five nights in a row, just a couple of blocks away. But no one who went to hear him sing in Madison Square Garden knew anything about Cape Man because the same marketing firms and PR firms that are on Broadway that everybody uses never thought of putting a ticket booth on 150th Street at Broadway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And getting and, and, and accessing a community of upper Manhattan that is never marketed to to come to Broadway. So uh, I think that that is that is a part of uh, this, uh, the self destructive nature of Broadway. I see yeah, I my and I think the price point windows are. Um, uh, or queuing up. I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Because I'll say, you know, what? Well, you know, I'm not going to talk about any artistic merit. It's certainly one about Tyler Perry, but this is a man who who marketed to an audience that no one else marketed to. Yeah. And 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 uh, filled those filled these seats in these theaters that you know weren't small, 300, 500 seat houses. Night after night after night, because he 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 valued that audience, and and you know and you know there's just all these stereotypes that you know uh, uh, certain people can't afford it. So, but it's it's not true because like like you know Wendell's saying they're they're going to see Mark Anthony they're supposed, supposed to be out. I mean, there's there is money there is, but there, it, I just feel like that audience is just not uh, it's just not valued. But the people who have been doing this for doing the same sort of job and marketing the same sort of people for 50 years. So, so what do we all think? Is you know, I, I remember the lie that I feel like I've been told for uh, for the beginning of my career. I started my theater career in Washington, D.C., then moved to Minneapolis, and I was there for about six years in D.C. for two years before that. And, like the entire time I was there, it means that people of color, specifically black people, didn't want to go see stories that didn't have black people in them, right? Like or only wanted to see a specific type of story. And I remember my first day at True Colors, I walked out on stage and there's 300 plus black people there just to see the story, right? Like to be there in the theater. And I realized that I had been fed alive for the first decade of my career on who we want to have in our audience. And I think there's that unlearning that needs to happen, but I, you know, I'm very interested in what Tracy is saying um, and what Wendell is saying about like, you know, we really have to try to break through. And I wonder where that starts. Um, you know, by the time people become uh, seasoned producers in the industry, we've learned so many uh, tricks that we have to unlearn. Like, there's a start in, um, you know, those tactics that you use in high school, like the bake sales and the way that you go out and you promote your show and lawn signs and things like that. When people are at the university level, do we have to retrain people at the, at the Browns, at the Yales, at all the MFA programs uh, or the MBA programs from getting up to administration degrees? Like, is that where we need to unlearn these traits? Um, because it seems like, you know, by the time people become seasoned producers, they only want to do what has been tried and true. Uh, so I'm really interested in what this COVID moment can get us to stop doing and start um, changing and shifting. It, it feels like now that the machine has had to stop, we can uh, teach it new tricks. And I don't even understand how that, how you can believe that that could be true, that black audiences won't go see, uh, Play white plays when, you know, all the movies forever were with white actors. Yeah. You know, all the TV shows with with white actors, and we watch those shows, and we go to those movies, and we find somehow find our stories in those stories, and find our humanity in those in those stories. And every book I ever read up until I went to college was by, by a white male author, and I somehow find my way in that to that. So that is just some kind of I just think lazy ass excuse mm -hmm. to not expand or to not. Um, you know, there's no special special way to get us in the in there. It's, it's, it's the same as anyway. It's the same as everybody. It's the same way that you, you you promote the next Marvel movie or anything else. 
Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's no special class. I don't think or anything to it. It's just, it's just recognizing us as a, as an economic and p political and cultural force. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that they're afraid to have us in the theater? <laughs> fear? There are what? Say that again. I said, do you think it's fear that, you know, that they don't want us in the theater? No, it's feigned, it's feigned, uh, it's feigned ignorance. It's uh, it's mm. feigned. Um, uh, it's 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 being in denial. Mm. Real artists, all artists, I think, genuine, authentic artists understand that the more specific you are with your story, the more universal it becomes. Yeah. And it 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 does not matter. People will respond because they recognize something that is authentic, right? They are in love. I've seen it in Romeo and Juliet and I've seen it in Brokeback Mountain. I know love, it's just love. And so once we get, once we call out producers and I'm a producer, I, I, I won a Tony award. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pay for it. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but once we recognize, once we recognize that people will respond to something that is authentic and a lot of times people use the economics to uh to justify their denial or their uh, uh implicit biases and uh bigotry and prejudice um until someone else does it and they go oh i didn't know you know and it's so interesting that you i, I just remember all these experiences that i have that people that reminds me that folks just have not been marketed to that they haven't been invited to come as this is someone that I want uh, I want you, you to be a customer you know and I'll never forget when P Diddy that was his name then did yeah. raisin in the sun raisin is that right yeah yeah and black folks man I saw it like twice black folks in front of me were like oh my gosh she slapped it I didn't see that coming and I was thinking where the hell have you been for 40 years? Everybody knows this, but they were seeing it for the first time. There were so many people who, you know, were coming for the first time. At that time, you couldn't take your drinks to the seats and stuff and learning the protocol of coming to the, the oh, I can't take my drink to the seat. I didn't know that, right? It, it's because they weren't invited to, right? Yeah. They, they weren't invited there. And another experience was, I, a little known trivia, was the fact that I did the last three weeks of piano lesson, the first run. After Charles Dutton, I played Boy Willie. And friends of mine were in uh, the beauty shop, which is one of those non-union plays uh, going around to, you know, uh, the awful name, the Chitlin Circuit. <laughs> yeah. Right? And it was playing the Beacon Theater. I'll never forget that. And I went there, and they got me a seat. And I sat there, and I said, we're closing piano lesson. We just have a thousand seat theater. Here's the beacon. Which fourth, how come these people aren't coming just a few blocks down Broadway? And I realized that they hadn't been marketed to that. And it's uh, and and that's and that's a business choice. That's not an artistic choice. And and therein lies the problem. Um. Uh, I was lucky enough to to work on The Color Purple. And um, one of the things I can say in, um, in the um, praise of our producer is that he was able to find a way to find that 3,000 people a night for three solid years. And, and then, you know, and then we did, and then five years later, there was a revival that brought in another 1800 people a night for, you know, for another two years. And it, and it was um, his, um, what he learned um, was <clears throat> that it was um, by marketing through the churches, the church connections, um, that that was the way to find the audience for the show. And that, that I think that there's a, there's an aspect of, of church that is, that is, profoundly powerful in the theater. It's it's why just watching it by yourself on TV will never be quite as wondrous as being surrounded by a whole bunch of other bodies that are responding and breathing and laughing and that. But I, I knew that that um, 
for the color purple, I mean, first of all, it was a great piece of work by Alice Walker and everybody knew that and everybody knew that everybody in it was wondrous and so good. But but that's still, there was still the magic, uh, the, not the magic, the, um, the, the determination of Scott Sanders to find that audience. And I think you're, you're just exactly right. It is not, you don't go in through the regular ways. You know, you don't go show ads on late night TV, for example. And producers know that. Yeah. And they ignored it. Uh, I first started producing when I didn't have a seat at the table to say it. You know, your conference room, everyone's at the table. And then there's the guy sitting along the wall. I was the guy at the door. Right. Uh, and could not get them to market to the community, which is black radio and the churches, you know, mm -hmm. and um, which is the same way we do the New York Times. You know, uh, you would be in the living section for the New York Times is logical uh, because that's the audience that, you know, will come. And uh, it's just it's it's uh, it's it's a feigned ignorance. They know it and they choose not to do it. And a part of that is uh, the implicit racism, right? Like, and today they, they had an article in the New York Times today. I said, Bla black plays are knocking on the Broadway's door. Will it open? And what it's about is to challenge those theater owners and then also for us to be our own producers. And uh, I've tried to do both. And um, there are always going to be challenges. And then there's, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and all those difficulties that go along with it. But I, I know for a fact that sometimes the theater owners, they make their money by having a theater not go dark. So the implicit racism that happens is, I know that's a successful play, but we have someone coming in behind you. Right. And even though I get the gravy, you know, uh, because I'm a theater owner, I have a floor, I get my rent, no matter how good or bad you do. And as long as this theater is, uh, is, is the lights are going, then we don't have, I'm making my bottom line. And a part of that is uh, what a lot of black producers have experienced was, wow, man, I know things are going well, but we have something else coming in here. And uh, we have a contract. And I said, you don't have any option to ask them to go to another theater or whatever. And they said, no. And I said, but there's always been opportunities where that's been able uh, to be shifted. When they have a success, they find another theater for you or not. And I think sometimes part of it is even with the money, that's not what they're interested in. And that's where you see this sort of uh, uh, explicit racism that happens in the theater. That even though you're successful, uh, that's not the success that I'm interested in. You know, I actually had a banker tell me, I know you guys are paying your bills and all of that stuff, but we're not going to readjust this loan and we're calling it because we just don't want to do business with you. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's literally what he said. I'm like, OK, all right. So now, you know, I, we don't have to dance around the bush anymore. Yeah. Um, and so that that's what we're looking at. I mean, I, I think that a part of that is, is 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 something that we all have to recognize is true. And then I also ask people and uh, artists of colors and producers of color that uh, Broadway is not the only way. You know, if you're doing really good work yes. and really good commercial work and there's ways to make money, uh, let's do it somewhere else. That's why, yes. well, I don't like his material. I love his business model. And that's Tyler Perry. You know, his, mm -hmm. his business model was he made $70 million doing plays. Yep. So. Yeah, I was an usher. You know, it was so funny because um, Jamil was saying he was in D.C. I remember being in D.C. and um, and uh, volunteering to usher at the Warner Theater. And I had never heard of Tyler Perry. And I just remember seeing all these black folks coming in. I was like, wow, what's going on here? And he would be, you know, there for a week, but end up having to stay four weeks in the same place. And every night just packed and packed and packed. Um, you know, you, you said something really important, though, because I'm just, you know, I'm thinking this is like how many times, you know, as black folks are we going to keep knocking on the door like, hey, you know, can we get in? You know, we got good plays, you know, with this, with that, until we just decide to move it some other place. Because I, I have to say, I also think, you know, once again, sort of using the Tyler Perry model, it's a, you know, anytime we are 
as black people are allowed to come into a space where there's sports or music or something like that, we come in and we just, we slay. We, we, we create, we, we change, we change, we change the game. Mm -hmm. And, but letting, letting us in, what, what inevitably might happen is more Tyler Perry's who, who end up buying a uh, old army base and, and, and creating their own studios because it, it, it's, it's not just about making money. It's also what you realize that you say, Oh, I have to open up my, I have to start reading these other plays with these other people of, you know, the, outside of my own experience. And if I'm really outside of my own experience, maybe, you know, the people who are reading, they, they want to see somebody who could, could relate to their experience. And maybe my job is in jeopardy or my business model is in jeopardy. But if I just keep this tight to the people that I know, my business model is going to, is going to be fine because I don't, I don't have to worry about, I don't know this, or I don't know that, or I, I have to or going to communities I'm not safe with. So it's like, it's, it's, it's almost safer to just keep it, to keep it tight than it is to expand because you expand, you open yourself up to actual competition from other communities, from other people, from other communities. Yeah. yeah. Tyler Perry is not asking anybody's permission to do anything. He does what he wants. It hasn't that always been the fear? Yeah. 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 Well, I hope we get a really strong reset on all of this, um, of this view by producers that only certain plays can do well and only certain plays are worth investing in. I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a real possibility that the that the doors are just going to open um, because there's a realization that that the voices of people of color in a, are are crucial to our understanding of each other, and if we don't hear the stories, then we're not going to know each other. We you know we, we it's, it's so important that this change on Broadway and on te in television in all of our storytelling media, um, I mean, it, it has to become more representative or, or nobody will is going to want to watch anything. That's what I feel because we all, I mean, if there's one thing that this political moment has really shown us is that we have to hold together here as a country or, or people not even very smart ones can pull us apart and destroy us. And I don't, and pl please, I don't want that to be true. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, James was a student of mine at Juilliard. And I, I made, I mean, well, I don't want to, I, I mean, James is a, an extraordinary writer and I was so happy when the Berkshire people, you guys picked him up and, um, and I, I mean, if I had the ability, I would find theaters for for every writer that we train. But that it's 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 going to get better. I know that the Lilies Lily Awards at the moment are are placing a statue of Lorraine Hansberry <coughs> at BAM um, that we are um, really excited about, and the, and part of what we're doing is rate is in creating the statue is to raise money for women of color who want to enter graduate programs in writing. Um, Tracy, it's exactly like the, the thing that you would have been looking for is what we're going to try to create for you with this, for, for the young you with, with this collection of money and, and the, and, and making it clear that Lorraine Hansberry mattered and mattered to not just to, to, Black people, but to all people, Lorraine Hansberry mattered so deeply. Um, and I, and I, the more we can try to work together for mutual um, enforcement, <laughs> engagement, uh, contact, and, and in fact, just flat out love, you know, I love James Tyler. I, and I, and I really, I want to, and I feel great. I mean, that, how could I not? You know, I, that's the that's the thing. I just want to feel like it. It needs to. We need to be able to say that now in 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 life, in open life, in in our work, in our theaters. And we need to put the muscle on people that are not yet willing to give us the money that they have that we need. You know, since you brought up James and someone we all know here, obviously. Uh, something, Wendell, when you guys were talking earlier, all of you, about both marketing, different <laughs> audiences, et cetera, 
Wendell, you remember that event we did at that restaurant? It was before, like three weeks before the play opened. We just started rehearsing it with you and the great late Joe Robinson and James and, Smith and Michael Wolkowitz. And we had this event at Marcia Pendleton, who the specialty is bringing in um, the community of audience that we've just been talking about. And a lot of people showed up at this thing and Wendell and Roger were very generous with their time. And they, I never saw anything like this because on the way out, they all said, we're gonna come and see the play. Now, people say that to us all the time. Three weeks later, because we were in a 100 seat theater, 59, 59, we were there every night, and obviously the acting. I saw all those people. They all came up and said, see, I told you I would be here. They came to the thing. So that's point number one. If you reach it, they will come. Number two, the extraordinary thing about that audience, and I put this really on James's work, and something I think you said, Wendell, earlier, and if one of the other guys, forgive me, about the more specific you are, the more universal the work is. And that's the way he writes. And so we would look, and I would say, I, I don't know that we ever measured it, but being at every performance for a month, a little more than a month, the audience was 50% black and 50% white, and everybody had the same experience. Uh, and it was, it was kind of remarkable. So I think it's, but it shouldn't be an exception. It should be the common practice. It should be the rule. And I think that's what we're all talking about. And oddly, weirdly, that we've all been given this sort of, you know, a big, a big teacher, uh, the universe gave us all a time out in the corner. And now we got to kind of figure some stuff out. And then some terrible shit happened, and we got to figure that out. So we're, we're given an opportunity, and I think these convers kinds of conversations, but it's got to be action. I mean, it's great we're talking about, it, but a lot of people uh, talk about we got to act. We got to do something. Yeah, there's two things that makes me uh, it brings to mind when I have these conversations. It's normally in producing uh, production meetings, right? Uh, artists understand that the producers uh, are the ones who uh, <laughs> who are who are holding on to other uh, ideas. Uh, but it reminds me of when I did uh, Miss Evers Boys in San Francisco at ACT, and uh, I have a cousin from Chicago. I mean, he is hardcore Chicago. You know, never went to the theater. You know, he's just a super cool dude that just hung out and did step dancing on Saturday nights. And he was just cool. And that's my cousin, John. He was cool. And John came to see Miss Evers Boys and he was blown away. And the next play I did, I played Creon in Antigone. And I invited John. I said, man, I know, listen, a Greek tragedy. He may not really go for this. And John came to the play and I couldn't wait to get his reaction, you know. And I went, he said, man, let me tell you something. See that Miss Evers boys you did? That was fantastic. That was fantastic. But that ain't got shit on this Antigone, <laughs> right? This was amazing. Man, I had never heard of this, you know? And it, all of a sudden, it was as if I was speaking to someone in, you know, 435 BC who had just seen it at the Herod Atticus Theater and was getting the moral of the story at the beginning of this, uh, of, of this triptych uh, from Sophocles, who, who had a spiritual awakening, like, you know, so, uh, and he was just so moved by Antigone and, uh, and, and just floored by, you know, the, the, man, if Creon had just listened, that's all he kept saying, if Creon had just listened, and you realize he was the last person you would expect to be moved by Antigone. Mm. But it was so truthful and right. so human. So I tell that to producers all the time. Don't assume, make assumptions about your audience. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. The other thing is we have the template when it comes to, I'm going back to the, the virtual aspect. Jamil is right. You have to put a priority on those live audiences. If you notice, the streams don't work without the live audience, right? Even in the silences, you can mm -hmm. feel the audience there that were present when they filmed it right. yeah. and gives you that guidepost. And one of the things that I'm a digital artist in residence with uh, the University of Michigan, 
right now. And one of the things that they have a great public health department. Um, and one of the experiments, one of the things that I was trying to promote, especially with uh, James's play, Some Old Black Man, was how can we put together a protocol for the future if COVID doesn't go away, which is a real possibility. That's the thing that people aren't thinking about. How are we going to live in an age of COVID where we don't have a vaccine? Right? I think well, I guess you got your answer. Oh, no. oh my God. <laughs> yes. oh, oh my Get goodness. Ready. Go underground. Oh. So, <laughs> was, Creon, you better listen, Creon. Uh, no, man. And so, that was great. So, that was a piece of drama. Yeah, that's, sure. that's a piece of drama. Um, so I, I am proposing if we have a small audience mm. as that guidepost for a live stream, mm. if we take them, do a rapid test for like 30 or 40 people where they're in the room, where the actors and, and director... Yeah for a pieces that small in size, like some old black man, can quarantine to four weeks of rehearsal. Then as we produce it and, and do a three or four day production run and then live stream it with the audience that has been tested, hmm. right? There's that hybrid of live and the stream. Hmm. So that's for one consideration, because we may not get a vaccine, contrary to what everyone is saying. We don't have a vaccine for AIDS. So that's one, which is sort of a live stream of a hybrid live production that with a small audience tested so that people can get a guidepost of reacting and have a sense of audience there. The other thing is the live stream should be seen as ancillary. This is the producer talking ancillary uh, revenue stream. Just like mm -hmm. the first run of a movie in the theaters, everyone gets excited about. And when it goes away, basically the first run of a Hollywood film is marketing for the secondary uh, and ancillary uh, markets. Mm -hmm. for all the DVDs and the, the on demand and all of that that will live post uh, the first run. So we should look at our live productions as the first run of a film. And so there's excitement to still go see it. People around the world had heard about Hamilton. They bought the album, but they hadn't seen it. And so now here a year or two later, it's finally coming out. And I think that's, that's the model for the future when it comes to theaters like True Colors. All of a sudden True Colors has a hit in Atlanta. We all know about it. We read the reviews, we see what's happening. And imagine I'm sitting in Shefford, Sheffield, Right? I'm in Sheffield in England, and I heard about this production. I read about it in American theater, and the live stream starts August 1st, and I'm, prop, and I, and I'm going to be able to get to see it. Right? Because here you are, Mr. Jude. You're on a live stream right now with an audience member from Sheffield right now listening to us. So Cynthia Pease can go, one day I will see that production. And I think that's the production model and protocol, I think the future is there. Can't wait to get you to that show, Cynthia. <laughs> Lodi, what do you think of all this as a, you know, from the commercial side of it, everything we've been talking about? Well, you know, what we found in TV is, is when you had a show and put it into syndication, it built a bigger audience for the original production. So it doesn't, take away your audience and we'll see what happens with Hamilton now that everybody's had the chance to see it on Jesus. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a storm there sorry um, very exciting you know I, I think we'll see but I think what film will never capture is the communal experience and being 30 feet away from amazing performers and watching them and, and, and catching the slip and catching the interactions and and being part of something and I think with people locked up the way we are and everybody just devouring entertainment in our homes, there's nothing left for me to watch on Hulu. So I'm going to see everything that comes out. I'm going to go to every live event I can get to once I feel it's safe again. And I'm looking at this next generation of kids who are living through basically 
a World War I or a World War II type event, and they don't see color as much as my generation. They don't see sexual orientation as much as my generation. They're going to be the next generation creating things. They're going to be the Picassos, the, the Brecks, the, the, the people who come out of a world event and want to shake it up. And I'm fascinated by what they bring to theater and what they're going to do and who's going to come to see that. Hmm. So if we're talking about it, I know we're coming up on the hour. I guess we hit the hour, but you know what? We're not on the network, so we could go over them if we want. <laughs> Anybody got dinner plans? Okay, good. Well, all right. Yeah, you do. Jim, you got What are you doing? I, I got a rehearsal I got to go run, but like I, I'm, I'm in it until I can. All right, all right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up soon. I just want to answer one thing, just in terms of storytelling, since we got a lot of playwrights on this call as well. Um, you know, with what, what's been happening since May 25th, I mean, it's been happening for 400 years, but what's been in the news every hour of every day, appropriately, finally, since May 25th. Just in terms of storytelling, is this an opportunity to also make sure that there, that we address, we in a, I mean, collectively, all of it, all, all, all of that. In other words, are, is it, is it on the writers? Is it on the artistic directors to find those plays and produce them? Is it on both? I guess what I'm saying is for, for the writers on the call, which is pretty much all of you, um, do you see going forward and looking at the stuff you write in in a different way or not? Just curious. You know, I think it's gonna be some and some. You know, I think there are people who will, who will find um, the shock of the isolation they have felt um, in in this um, to be what they want to write about. I mean, it, but it will it will probably be because it connects to what the isolation they all were already feeling. Do you, do you know the separation, the 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 distance? Um, I, I think I think at least what I know from the writers I talk to all the time, basically my students that. It's been very hard for people to write during this time, but I do believe they have been noticing things they would not have seen before. And so those plays may not be available as soon as the, as soon as the disaster is over. They, they may come much later um, when it occurs to people what they have, that, that they're free, free now to write. They're not just stuck in their houses. I think there's been a lot of, um, I understand there have been a lot of people who never wrote plays who suddenly are writing them. People in the theater, people, sound designers, or you know, those people who suddenly said, felt like, oh, this is my chance to go and write a play I always wanted to. And but but writer writers were having, I mean, writers who can only be writers were having real trouble doing anything um, that that was what they used to do when they got to go to their garret and write. Do you, I mean, do you know, it, it's a, it's been interesting to me how much trouble real writers have been in about writing. And I, and I don't mean to say that that's true for everybody, but it's certainly been true for everybody that I've talked to. And I, you know, is that they, um, they've found projects, but they're not necessarily those kind of deep heart projects that, that have been bothering them for 10 years. Now, I mean, I just, I just don't know what we'll get. We, it, I don't know. I just don't know. Do, do you guys remember John O'Neill and the Free Southern Theater in Mississippi? And part, you know, we got- New Orleans. That was Mississippi, no? I, I, it was in New Orleans. We, they were based in New Orleans. That's the reason I'm an actor there. So they, so you know what I'm talking about, because we got got to work with them once, and I know that <clears throat> part of the mandate of that theater was to write stuff out of the community and the moment and the real stuff that's going on. Am I right, Mendel? Absolutely. Uh, they would go to communities and do plays and actually have workshops with uh, with the folks. They were following the marches of the civil rights movement, and yeah. uh, and so during the day they would have workshops. Oh, and I think they disbanded in the early '80s. But I, I'm wondering. If we're at a place like that again, what do you think? I don't think we ever left. 
a lot of theaters have that uh, component already where yeah you reach out uh, you know the empty space and uh, Peter uh, Brooks Peter. was uh, famous for that you know um, and I think it's ongoing I I think this is an opportunity where it's even more important that people's experiences are then flushed out um, and people understand the role of, of theater and art. It's been, we, we've lost that sensibility. We've been educated and socialized to believe that art is just entertainment. Right. You know, it's just there to please us. And it's not the place where we come together and reflect on what our, of our existence and collectively determine what our values are uh, and this is not an individual uh, uh, experience, you know. It's not something that you think about at home about yourself. This is that's the role of art. That's the reason the Greeks got the end, sort of Oedipus cycle every year, you know, to be reminded of the that the the moral of the story is. Um, and I think what happens is you're reminded of how important it is in moments like this. That's why I play like Waiting for Godot is so resonant in times of trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we did a production in New Orleans here that resonated post Katrina because we felt like, you know, Vladimir and Estragon. Uh, Susan Sontag did the production in the Balkans at that, in the height of that civil war. It's a great production. And it, we were all connected to Samuel Beckett, you know, under Nazi occupation when he uh, uh, first wrote it, you know? The, the individual being oppressed and suppressed in, in the darkest hours in our humanity and that we're always searching for something. And the lesson is don't look for something outside of yourself, but find it within so that you can sustain yourself. And it's a lesson that goes on and on and on. And we learn it at times of great peril. We revisit that play, you know, at this moment in time, all mankind is us. Let us do something while we have the chance. You know, that line rings out. And what happens is I think now people will go back to those same plays and find that within themselves, you know. Um, speaking of Lorraine Hansberry and Raising in the Sun, you know, it, we may have become all so accustomed to it and know it. But, man, at times like this, I could just hear, not my father's money. Come here, I, you know, Travis, this is my son, and I got to, I'm going to do this in front of my son because it's important. That lineage and that pride is important. So I think we never lost it. It's even more important now that we speak to people's truths uh, and give them a platform. And that's what these great writers do. Mm. Mm. So how do we, uh, you know, I just, but how do, how do we get there? Like, um, so, you know, recently there's been a list of demands by, um, from BIPOC group of artists called We See You, uh, We See You, okay, and it lists list changes that um, that they want to see happen, and they want you know they want to find some solutions. So, in your opinion, like, what do you think the roots uh, to these problems are, and some possible solutions, or how are we going to get there? Look, I just think if if, if these theaters, I mean, who knows where we're going to be. Uh, you know, post COVID or what, what post COVID even means. But if these theaters are going to survive, if they if they don't expand their theater, theater, is, you know, the idea of you know, sort of, you know, uh, you mentioned before, but sort of banging on the door and begging or asking. I mean, if they're if these theaters are going to survive, if they don't expand their theater, their base, if they don't expand their audience, they're just not going to survive. I mean, the theaters that actually do survive this 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 COVID. Yeah, you know, if they don't, they just to, so it, it is. It behooves them to act to actually figure out a way to reach those audiences, it's to reach these these playwrights. Um, because I, another thing I also think is that you know we are all, you know, binging TV, and there are thousands and thousands of shows out there, and you know, and we can find every type of genre, every type of show we want for whatever, whatever mood we are in at any given time right now at any given time and i just think when we when we when people actually do go to uh back to live theater i think they're, they're, they're going to want to have that sort of 
they're gonna they want to have yeah. those different kind of options that you know yeah. some people are gonna are gonna watch what is food play but somebody's gonna watch a, a comedy somebody's just gonna want you know you can't just keep having the same stories it's just not gonna work anymore because we have been exposed to the world now yeah. Netflix and Hulu. we have mm. been exposed to other cultures and, and that is one of the, the, the great benefits of this is that we it, the, the world has sort of opened up to people in, in a way i think that hasn't before if only because we have nothing in our hands but time so you know forget you know they can listen to the demands they can now listen to the demands but i tell you what they just they just want some they just want some yep well we lost jamil who actually went to work went to went to rehearsal for him said to say goodbye. Um, anybody have a last thought or what they want to get in? Well, I want to get, you know, if we don't mind, I'd like to invite James and Rick back on the screen. There we are. Um, and just, I'll just say this to, to you guys, you know, various of us have collaborated with various of you uh, and different combinations over the years. And uh, and so you are our first audience for this debut broadcast. And I think we accomplished exactly what we wanted. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for being, for being open, for being really, really open, you know, with your thoughts and your experiences. And you know, it's weird, we're all, doing curtain speeches and talking to audiences and you look out at the 100 or 200 or 700 people and this is like you know, watch it. there's people watching this and we can't see them it's very strange I gotta tell you. but you're seeing little text and messages on the screen so i i sounds like people are getting a lot out of this anyway Joe. That enough james Joe. yeah james and rick and yeah, yeah. you've been sitting back there wishing you could i mean it's been a great conversation i just wanted to go around to everyone and get everyone's answer to this. If there was like one, sorry, is that me? That if there was just like one wish, okay, one wish you had for the future of theater that could come true, what would you choose? Anyone can start. I know it's so bad. Just one? Yeah, just one, only one. Well, all voices. This is what we need. All voices, old, young, people, people from everywhere, from writers in other countries, translated into the shows here. People keep. I mean, some kind of sharing of all the voices is what we need, so that we know who we all are. That's that's a big missing piece. Is is who are the who are the people I haven't heard from? I don't know because I haven't heard from them. You know, I mean, there's there's that, and and whether that involves theaters changing the producers changing the way they think about what plays will work, or whether it's us finding other venues in which to go see things. I mean, whether we need to hit get on the translators. I mean, it's just we need we need the to hear the whole human choir sing. That's my sense of it. It's not just, you know, the men's chorus or the supreme, you know, it's it's everybody. That's what we need. That's my wish. Great. Who's next? Uh, wow. This is just for post, specifically, I guess I've been saying it all along, but for post COVID, uh, um, that that is the new element that uh, every theater uh, understands that there's the dress rehearsal, you know, there's the last run through in the studio. There's uh, the dress rehearsal. Um, there's tech rehearsal. And uh, there's camera rehearsal. And that that element will be there forever. How many of us wish we could have seen, you know, just even the, you know, Richard Burton's Hamlet, you know, or, or uh, I wish I could go back and see Kate Nelligan 
in As You Like It at the RSC when I was 16 years old. I saw that production. Now, a part of it is there will always be that special place in time that only the people that were there have that shared experience. And you would say, oh, if you only knew. Now, I felt that when I saw Barbershop Chronicles. And I said, man, Patrice, I can't say his last name, but Patrice, if you had seen that performance, that to me at the National Theater is on par with the famous, you know, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence Olivier's Richard the Third. I'm telling you, if you could have seen it, and then the pandemic happened, and you could see it, and people all over the world got to see it who weren't there, and that's when I said, "Oh, wait a minute, this is an element that we should bring along after all of this." And so that's what I would like to see for all theater, because I want to be there opening night for the Gate Theater when you know, Dublin is opened and something happens. I would like to see the production at the National Theater of Uganda when they reopen. And I would like to see theater, you know, all the places that I can't be at physically when this is lifted. And so that's what I wish for theater post COVID. Good one. You know, I think I'd like to see the model change. I'd like to see a world where a family of four could come to a play every few weeks and it wouldn't break the bank. Uh, you know, I, I look at these ticket prices and I look at, you know, what a soda costs and I just go, you know, we're pushing them away. We're pushing them away every time we charge them $23 for a, a Milky Way bar. You know, so I, I just feel like we have to take our side of it back a little too and go, all right, how do we make this a more friendly experience so people want to come more so people want to be in those rooms every time they hear about a play let alone you know just have to work out the dates and everything i think there's a way to make it affordable i think that's a great one yeah uh, yeah and i think along those lines I, I guess my wish would be that um you know going to the theater would be as easy and as common as going to the movies and uh, so, so that, you know, uh, kids are, are exposed to it from an early age so that by the time they're, they're adults, it's, it's something as exciting as, as going to see the Knicks play or something like that. Um, I don't know how that would happen, but that's, that's what I wish. James, you know, I'm not technically a guest, but I just want to throw one thing in here about a wish. Um, and maybe it's because I'm teaching the last 14 years in teaching at Wesleyan in, in Columbia. And I'm thinking about this a lot as I look at my students and what's happening, what's happening, but it's not happening enough, is that every young writer, every young artist, writer, actor, director, producer, designer, who isn't, frankly, a white guy, would have the opportunities that I've had. I mean, they were there. So, yeah, I had to show up, but I had the I had the option to show up. And that's not been true for a lot of people. And that would be my fervent wish, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because we're going to have a much more interesting theater world when that happens. And I think that we got to do whatever we can do to make that happen. Okay, uh, you know what? Um, can I answer to James? Yeah, of course. Okay. I mean, I'm a <laughs> you know, my wish for theater is that um, that COVID teaches all of us that it's time for us to just level the playing field. That we all have stories that's as important as you know the next person's stories, and that they all deserve to be told in a real way. Um, and so that's that's my wish for the theater. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, what do you wish? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I like about this conversation. That we're living through a time where we're really encouraged to be divided and to take uh, different positions. And the great thing about this conversation is it's very clear that we're all in this together. And it really comes down to, I, I happen to think that this reset button is ultimately going to affect incredibly powerful positive changes. And I think it's a very simple thing, just like this conversation. My is 
that when I go to the theater, it will look like the world outside the theater. And that's a very simple kind of wish, and it's never been true in a theater, ever. And I have a feeling that, um, and I think Tracy said this, that what is going on now is an unstoppable force. And the people who choose to live in the past and to do things the old way, just through sheer economics, commerce, are going to get left behind. And so I think it's valuable to, to talk about this. And I think it's I think it's really valuable for all of us to find out what actions we can take. And talk will take us part of the way there, and action will, will take us the rest. I think we need to really, really look at who is responsible for change. Is it is it artistic directors in regional theaters? Is it is it commercial producers? Is it artists? Is it audiences? I have, and this is perhaps naive, but I feel like when the work, when the work really speaks to the truth of our time, everything else takes care of itself. The audience, should, the audience should show up, and those are the plays that people will produce. So anyway, I just want to thank you all for uh, for for joining this. It was it's really a privilege to be a part. Of it. I I second that, and. Um... To our audience that's watching, the last thing I'll say, I would be remiss, and our board of directors would chastise me if I didn't remind us all that whether it's Berkshire Playwrights Lab, uh, it's us, or it's Berkshire Museum, our partners, or Neil Theater, Two Colors, uh, you know, we're all in our financial state. I mean, all people, but. If you're thinking of supporting a not-for-profit theater, this would be a lovely time to do that, and we would appreciate it very much, whatever that might be. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. We have little buttons and things you can click. Um, or you can just go to Rick's house and hand him there. <laughs> Thank you, guys, folks. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. 19th. So everybody out there, take a look. We got a new panel on the 19th. Thank mm -hmm. you.